Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, my dear brothers, sisters, friends, and the foes out there. And welcome to another episode of the Blood Brothers podcast with your host, Dili Hussein. Before I introduce today's guest, I want to remind all the avid podcast listeners that you can find this show on all the major audio platforms. And if you're tuning in and watching on YouTube, don't be cheeky. Remember to subscribe to the Five Pillars YouTube channel. Today's guest is an esteemed scholar and imam, a dear friend, brother, teacher and someone whose counsel myself and Five Pillars take very seriously. Um, he's someone who is a pioneering thinker and lecturer of our time, hailing from Birmingham. That's none other than Sheikh Saar Rashid. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sheikh, how are you? Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khairan for making the time on this Sunday to come. May Allah keep us in his safety and safekeeping, inshallah. Amin, amin, ya Rabb. How are things? Alhamdulillah, very well. How's your health? Remember, we are always in Ni'amullah, favors of Allah that can never be enumerated. We can never count the favors of Allah. Alhamdulillah. How's your health? Alhamdulillah, very well. Um, any more encounters with poison? No. Alhamdulillah, something I would avoid in the future. Was that actual poison you drank? If it were not the Christians in the debate, they could have determined that the bottle stayed on the table. And rather than speculating on whether it was poison or not, what should be uh, observed is the fact that the Christian woman, she was not brave enough to even drink the poison, even though her scripture yeah. required of a true Christian, a true believer of Sayyiduna Isa to Sorry. actually drink the poison. But she avoided Drinking the poison. During the COVID period, you had a bit of a COVID scare as well, right? Well, you did actually have it, no? Yes, but Alhamdulillah, it was fine. Alhamdulillah. Shaykh, let me kick off today's podcast with some uh, fiqh uh, questions. Um, I've done this with Dr. Shadi Al-Masri regarding Maliki Fiqh. You met him when he came in his visit yes. to the UK. Yes, he visited Birmingham. And I've done it with other uh, people of knowledge where I ask, you know, basic fiqh Q&A questions. So I'm going to ask you... Uh, some questions I'd like you to give me the answers from the Hanafi school obviously you can tell me if it's an issue of ijma the mutamad position the strongest position if there's a genuine difference of of opinion or of course you don't know am I okay to proceed? that's fine Richard. what can you recite if you don't know dua qunut for witr? so if, if someone doesn't know the supplication of uh, qunut yeah. they can recite whatever dua they know that would be permitted. Rabbana atina, Rabbana zalamna, all of those du'as. Yes, that would be permitted. Okay. With obviously an encouragement to actually learn qunut, right? Yes. Okay. What What do you do if you forget what raqah you are on when you're praying a fard salah on your own? So you've forgotten what number raqah you are on, the third one or the fourth one? So you go with the raqah, the cycle, that is what we refer to as ghalibul dhan, meaning... Uh, dominant thought you think you are for instance second rakah or third rakah mm -hmm. and then at the end you do sajda to saha which is the prostration of forgetfulness the Hanafis have their own specific method which is by reciting at tahiyat in the tashahud position yeah. up to abduhu wa rasuluh then giving salam once to the right mm -hmm. prostrating twice yeah. and then reciting the at tahiyat again and then completing the prayer with a salawat would the same apply if you forgot to recite a surah after Fatiha during a salah on your own? Yes, because time? reciting surah uh, a surah with surah al Fatiha in the first two raka'ah yep. of fard is wajib in the Hanafi school. So, a and a, a missing a wajib would require sajda to sahab. Okay. What? What if you have small food bits in your mouth? which is a common issue for some Bangladeshis because they have obviously supari and pan a lot. Obviously, the normal thing would be to do chuluti to rinse your mouth. But obviously, there could be times where you have bits in your mouth. What they mention in books like Nurul Idah, basic books in Hanafi school, is if it's the size of a chickpea and you chew it, then your salah is broken. It invalidates the prayer. Chew you, it, not swallow. Chewing. Because of uh, amal kafir. But if it's less than that, then it doesn't invalidate the prayer. 
can you swallow it if it's in your mouth? It should be avoided. If, it, but if, if, it's small, if it's smaller than a chickpea. S- more than a chickpea. Smaller than a chickpea. Uh, if it's smaller than a chickpea, it will not invalidate the prayer. Okay. Okay. They do mention uh, if someone has something like a sesame seed and it dissolves in the mouth and then he swallows it, it doesn't break the prayer. What if someone unintentionally, without any control, breaks wind during the tashah- shahud of the last the conclusion of the prayer. So if the person, he has, remember, sitting in the tashahud, in the end of the prayer, the duration it takes to recite a tahiyat is one of the uh, arkan of the prayers, for that duration. So if he sat for that duration and he completed the tahiyat and then he involuntary, in his wudu breaks, he passes wind, his prayer is complete. His prayer is done. Is there a difference of opinion on this, Mal? So they mention two positions. Uh, in the school, there are two positions. One is al khuruj bi sunni, which is doing something of his own device, must be done with the salam. Mm-hmm. So some people, they choose that as the mu'tamad position of the school, that if he doesn't do salam, his prayer is not valid. But the second position within the school is that the khuruj with salam is wajib. It's not sharta within the salah. And that is, the fatwa is actually given on the second. Okay. If you check the hashi of Ibn Abdin, it's on the second. Um, does your wudu break if you laugh during salah for the Hanafis? So this position is unique to the Hanafis. And some of the ulama, they mention that this demonstrates that the Hanafis actually act upon hadith before Qiyas. So li- uh, analogy. So which hadith is that? Uh, ruling there's a on? weak hadith in the Sunan of Dar Qutni that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was leading the prayer. And whilst le- leading the prayer, a man came in and fell. It mentions a well. And some of the Sahaba laughed out aloud, which is referred to as Qahqaha. And they were, at the completion of the prayer, they were commanded to repeat their wudu and prayer. So the Hanafis act upon that hadith. Though the hadith is weak. Though the hadith is weak, but they they only apply the ruling on prayers which have no sajda and ruku, which would mean in Salatul Janazah, it's not, it doesn't invalidate the wudu. In Salatul Janazah. And also in Eid prayer. So, uh... In uh, sorry, so just you, just in janaza. So if you crack, so if if someone passes wind, if someone passes wind in uh, salatul janaza, uh, they can do tayammum from the walls in the Hanafi school. If they pass wind in uh, Eid prayer, they can do tayammum from the walls. If they laugh at aloud, it will break the wudu and prayer in in Eid prayer, but in salatul janaza, it will only invalidate. The prayer. What constitutes as laughter? Laughter by definition, what how they define mm. laughter is laughing out aloud to the extent that the person next to you can hear your laughter. So it's the person next to you, not you hear yourself laugh. And yourself. Yeah. Yes. So uh, some of them, they mention that if someone hears themselves, it would l- invalidate the prayer as well. That would count as qahqah. Okay. While tabassum is just smiling. And that doesn't break. So if no. someone uh, smiles, that doesn't invalidate the prayer. Okay. Is chess permissible? So t- chess in the Hanafi school has four sh- conditions, four shurut, for it to be valid. If you check uh, Khalil bin Abdul Qadir and Nahlawi's book, al hadar or Ibaha, he mentions the four conditions. Uh, from those conditions is that the person does not uh, miss the prayers, the salah. It does not become addictive. They do not gamble. So they mention these conditions. With those conditions, chess is permissible in the Hanafi school. Unless it transgresses or, or violates, violates, those... violates any one of those conditions. Okay. Can we greet non-Muslims on their religious days and festivals? Christmas, Diwali, no. Hanukkah. This would be impermissible so if you check uh, Hanafi works like Multaq al-Abhur standard Hanafi works they mention 
the day of nairuz in the persian festivals mm-hmm. it's not permissible to greet them on those festivals with regard to that specific religious festival so a person can greet them but not greet them on a religious festival okay is selling or breeding dogs for profit permissible you see the outward of a particular hadith which is mentioned in bulugh al maram by al hafiz ibn hajar gives the impermissibility of this but the hanafis they take a different divergent opinion they they permit breeding of animals to sell those animals cats and dogs that's permissible in the hanafi school other that? schools prohibited so they have their own istidlal which is not uh uh something i will go into now but it's mentioned within the commentaries of hadith why the hanafis actually permit this for our non arabic listeners and viewers what was istidlal istidlal is inf- inference of from legal texts from quran and sunnah okay so under the within the hanafi school selling dogs for profit and breeding is permissible i wouldn't advise it in this day and age with the incidents with the xl bully dogs and mm. so many young muslim boys they want to Do- buy dogs and it's like it's an extension of the ego so a man who has no muscles he needs a dog to to demonstrate his ego so i wouldn't advise people to have these dogs there's no benefit in fact when they mention the permissibility of keeping dogs there's reasons for that like as guard dogs or uh, dogs for herding goats and sheep but in today's day and age it's become a fashion accessory so can i ask you three things um a dr- a muslim drug dealer who thinks having a guard dog will protect him on the roads that's not a justified reason a drug dealer is the, the biggest coward in the world uh i live in birmingham many drug dealers there they are cowards because they eat haram when they eat haram anyone who eats haram will always be a coward irrelevant to how many uh guns he holds or how many dogs he may have or how many people he has with him they will always remain cowards because they are eating haram and when they deal that drug uh the the addict they destroy the life of the addict and the family of the addict the dua of those people is against them uh even the, the non muslims of course because the non muslim in that case is mazloom he's a uh, the, he's an insan because remember the hadith states be careful of the dua of, of the, the mazloom even yeah. if he is a non muslim okay so uh, the poor woman who becomes addicted to drugs and then is prostituted irrelevant to whether she's a muslim or non muslim uh, the angels will curse the drug dealer So these cowards they would need these dogs Achoo. to protect them. What about the fact that we live in the UK, uh, a stable and secure country where we pay council tax for police and and for law enforcement services and emergency services is a dog really justified in most cases when you have this level of security in a country? I'm not talking about in some areas where it's very unsafe or high levels of robbery. I'm not this with a diver we're going on a digress here but I'm just talking about justification of having a dog because the way I see muslim brothers having dogs they use the security or oh, we need it for security and all stuff but really it's more to do with a flex there sh- it's, it's it's imitating rappers and drug dealers and gangsters in the mainstream is to protect themselves when they're dealing drugs on the roads and then thirdly they'll basically justify it by saying that they need a dog to look after their home when really their home isn't the type of home that you traditionally would think would need guarding for a dog what's your thoughts on as that as i said i don't think it's a, uh, validated through those excuses also take into consideration the saliva of a dog is najis mm-hmm. uh the sweat of the dog is najis also so it, it can be a cause of najis the hadith states that people keep a dog in the house the angels of rahma do not enter that house So as opposed to someone with two daughters in the house as in the sahih of ibn hibban he mentioned someone who has two daughters in a house a specific type of rahma of allah descends on that house it's in the sahih of ibn hibban alhamdulillah that's, that's beautiful to know yes so um, to have daughters in the house this is a source of rahma but to have dogs or pictures in the house the, the hadith clearly prohibits that 
under any circumstances within the Hanafi school, can a Muslim woman marry a non-Muslim man? That's totally uh, prohibited within the four schools. Billy Jma. So a Muslim woman to marry a kafir is totally impermissible. Whether he's Bi- a Hindu or a Christian. Billy Jma. Okay. With consensus. Uh, this would be totally impermissible. She should make him adopt Islam. And what is the status of that relationship? It would count as zina, as a fornication. Okay. Um, what is the position of the mustache in the Hanafi school? So the mustache, uh, of course, like the other schools, the, the trimming of the mustache from above the lip. Is my mustache okay at the moment? Yes, as long as it's not growing on, on top of the lip. No, it's clear. Yeah, that would be fine. So when it comes over the lips, it becomes a problem. Then it becomes makru. Makru in the Hanafi school means haram. Makru tahriman. So allowing it to grow above the, onto the lips would be makru tahriman and it should be trimmed. What about this way? That would be permissible. Because it's, the Ottoman Turks did it, people in the Indian subcontinent, muchne, kuchne, all that flex. That wouldn't be a proof though in the Hanafi school. No, I'm just saying that culturally it's quite... It's quite uh, culturally uh, they uh, shaved uh, also, but yeah. shaving would be haram. Okay. So, so long as it's not growing over the lips, yeah? Yes. Okay. Um, what is a Qaza haircut? So short back and side, what we have today, this issue is mentioned in the, the... Firstly, it's in Sahih Muslim, the prohibition of this type of haircut. But in the Hashi of Ibn Abdeen, what he mentions, it's to shave one side and to allow another side of the hair to grow. Does this apply to short back and sides today? The answer is, if the length of the hair exceeds three, the three fingers, exceeds three fingers, one side of the hair is longer than the other side by three fingers and one side is shaven, this would fall under this type of haircut, which is makru tahriman in the Hanafi school. If it doesn't exceed by three fingers length, then it would not fall under makru. So just to clarify, uh, if the hair exceeds... The width. The, so, so this much, yeah? Yes. This much on one side and completely shaved on the other side. This would count as qaza haircut. Do you regard my haircut as a qaza haircut? No. Okay. Um, and that's a common question. But you, you will find the reference for this within the Hashi of Ibn Abdi. Um, is there, do you, within the Hanafi school, what is the position on music other than the duff? drum so the some of the ulama they took position a lenient view on music like abdul ghani and nablusi rahimallah the damascene scholar mm-hmm. from 400 years ago while other ulama they took a strict position so uh, the likes of al-imam ibrahim al-halabi the author of multiqal al-abhur he wrote a book al-naqsu wal-waqsu li mustahil al-raqs mentioning the prohibition of musical instruments and raqs. Mm. To the point that even within the Shafi'i school, there, there are divergent views. So you have like Al-Ibn, uh, Al-Imam Ibn Hajar al-Haytami al-Makki. He has a famous work, Kaffa mm-hmm. uh, al on uh, prohibition of musical instruments. But then Al-Imam Abu Hamid al-Ghazali, rahimullah, took a lenient view like Abdul Ghani al-Nablusi, rahimullah. The correct view in my point from uh, from how I from my reading on this subject mm-hmm. would be more of a middle stance, which is that is that firstly the doff is permitted, and then there are those instruments alat which are clearly prohibited in the sunnah, like they would be like mu- uh, string instruments, for instance, guitars, violins. Yes, string instruments are one harp. These type of instruments. Okay. Now, a Sayyid Alawi Al Maliki Rahimullah in his Fatawa, he states that due to Saddu Dhariya, now this word Saddu Dhariya means barring the means, it's a great source of law for the Maliki school. So, for instance, Al Imam Malik Rahimullah, he prohibited grapes, uh, people from growing grapes, because he knew the grapes were being utilized for wine for wine so it's 
sometimes this law, Sadu Zari'a, applies to permissible things. As Sayyid Alawi states, we should apply Sadu Zari'a to many of the musical instruments because it leads to the haram type of music. What is haram bil ijma'? Uh, music which has lyrics which are uh, impermissible. Music uh, which is accompanied with alcohol. This is all impermissible by ijma. So foul, vulgarity, sexual lewdness, uh, the promotion of fahsha and all that kind of stuff. Exactly. Yeah. And, uh, and if it's associated with drinking and drugs, this type of music is totally prohibited by ijma. Why if it's associated with love? So then. That used to be a flex a thousand years ago. Poetry and singing about women and the love for women is something that uh, transcends all civilizations. Yes, so, so the, the, ulama, the ulama, they would teach books of literature, Arabic literature, where uh, love of women is mentioned, uh, works like Diwan al Mutanabbi, Maqamatul Hariri, all these uh, classical Arabic literature they have. Uh, but those books of poetry even contain vulgarity also. But they would teach it for a purpose, which was literature, in order to excel in language. So uh, in today's day and age, if someone uh, read a book of classical literature, which does contain vulgarity, it would not be totally prohibited, depending on the purpose of reading the book. But uh, Saddu Zariya is applied to those music, that type of music, which is totally haram in the Sharia. Then within the middle, we have the gray area. Now, Ibn Hazm, Ibn Hazm, he took a divergent opinion. Uh, there is, uh, there's another alim also, uh, a Maqtasi alim, who the author of uh, uh, the book on Shurut al Sitta, which is a book on conditions of the six scholars of hadith. They took a divergent opinion, but which was totally permitting all musical instruments also. To the extent that Ibn Hazm attempted to weaken a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari. And then uh, Al-Imam Ibn Salah, rahimullah, the author of the Muqaddima of mm. Ibn Salah, he condemns Ibn Hazm for this. So that would be a, a shad opinion, an anomalous opinion. So Sadd al applies to most music. Then we have certain instruments which are not declared haram totally by the Sharia. And it's a gray area. And then we also have the issue of raqs, which is dancing. So the Sufis have hadra, which my mashaykh in Syria, they perform hadra. Al-Imam Jalaluddin Suyuti gave the fatwa permissibility of hadra. Uh, other ulama also, Abdul Hayy al-Kattani and many other ulama, they permitted the hadra, which is doing dhikrullah with dancing, with raqs. But there were other ulama who prohibited this. They said this is not permissible. So that would fall into the issues of khilaf. And when issues fall into issues of khilaf, you cannot declare the Muslims as being fasiq, as okay. being transgressors. Zakhla khair for uh, that Q&A, Sheikh. I hope our listeners and viewers benefited from these questions because some of them are like everyday questions, um, especially for Muslims living in the West. I think it's things to do with music, uh, things to do with haircut, things to do with... You know, these kind of now with globalization, these questions are common in every Muslim country. So the, the haircuts, yeah. they were common in Damascus. Music is common uh, in Morocco. Everywhere you go, the, uh, globalization has changed the face of uh, the Islamic world. There was actually one, one last one which I forgot. What, what's the position of halala? So, so halala in the sense that a man and a wife have divorced, genuine divorce. Uh, in the sense that there's no messing about. Both uh, the, the husband had intent, gave her talaq, they parted. Three dro divorces. Three divorces. Under which circumstances can they remarry? So this is a, an important question. This halala. Because this has been abused by some people. Yes. So this halala now. Mm. Firstly, a planned halala. Zayd divorces his wife. Mm -hmm. Then he plans a halala by making another man marry his wife, have sexual intercourse with her, and then divorce her, and then Zaid marries her again. Mm -hmm. This planned halala is prohibited. The question is, some of them say, oh, the other man, the second man, may not have had sexual intercourse with her. He may have just been alone and isolated with her in a room, and then he gives talaq. The response to such a jahil 
uh, ignorant claim is that then the halala is not even done because the prerequisite is for it to be penetrative to to have sexual intercourse okay if there's no sexual intercourse it then not. it's not done in the first place but what is the legal status of this in the maliki shafi'i and hanbali school the planned halala is ineffective and it remains a zina it's ineffective in the three schools in the hanafi school the person who does the planned halala is sinful it's haram it's haram when they use the word makruh in the hanafi school it's not a light word they mean haram it's haram it's impermissible both makruhs makruh tahrimi so when they say the word makruh without qualifying that counts as makruh tahriman that's a rule in the hanafi school also when you hear the word makruh being used in the context of the hanafi school it is by default tahrimi tahriman unless okay. specified as tanzihan okay now in the hanafi school this action is haram so even though the nikah zaid takes back his wife with a planned halala his nikah is valid now but he is sinful for having done that the planned halala is totally impermissible this is common and is abused it's abused here in the uk where some people have made committees uh where they plan halala and they marry they marry women like a shia muta mm-hmm. momentarily marrying a woman having sexual intercourse with her and then permitting her to go back to her husband some of the hanafis in the uk and elsewhere have been doing this and this is something that should be condemned in the harshest of terms it's not permissible according to the hanafi school it's not permissible according to all four schools and i've heard shia in the past criticizing ahl sunnah sunni they, they people they use this yes they but they halal. should know also that it's not permissible in the in the four sunni schools it's not permissible in the hanafi school the nikah with her former husband is permitted but they are sinful for planning the halal and it's something that should be condemned okay zakhla khair i wanted to ask that one i forgot because of its relevance to the uk and the west where it has been abused sheikh has been four and a half years since you last came on alhamdulillah you were our first 10 guests or 12 guests and you you're back here uh for four and a half years mashallah alhamdulillah uh a lot's changed in both our lives respectively um you've been very busy uh, i've been very busy but one of the topics which we did not get to discuss uh, in much depth the last time you were on the show and if you recall the last time on the show you kind of gave us a um, an insight to the story of your life from a from a young child from your trips to pakistan from your uh, the encouragement you received from your father um in reading books seeking knowledge your early interactions and exposure to the different groups do you remember that conversation yes of course So today I want to pick up on a conversation which other groups and other movements are having they have been having this discussion behind closed doors for some years especially in light of the war on terror post 9/11 post 7/11 77 post prevent post all this kind of surveillance that's happening on the muslim community and that is muslim unity specifically intra sunni muslim unity right we've spoken off camera many a times with regards to how such a unity could look like uh, on a macro scale and on a micro scale here in the UK in your own respective towns or cities uh, and how it would look globally we've had this conversations off on the phone many a times how do you envisage any type of unity within sunni muslims those who identify as sunni those who call themselves we are ahl sunnah we are sunni muslims what kind of unity do you envisage i.e. a framework given the theological differences that exist the juristic differences that exist the cultural differences that exist hanafis of the subcontinent vis-a-vis the hanafis of asham and the turks and you, you can make that not even culture there are cultural influences in how we understand our 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 creed and our school um how how do you envisage 
and political differences as well. So with regard to Sunni unity and you identify Sunni, anyone who identifies himself as I'm a Sunni. I'm only talking about Sunni unity because I am of the position that for Islamic revival to take place, we don't necessarily need the unity with the Shia. That's Firstly, my position. my position is very clear. You, you cannot unite with deviants. Anyone who has deviated into kufr, unbelief, you cannot unite with them. That's totally impermissible. But as you mentioned, Sunni unity, firstly, ta'asub, ta'asub, which is an extreme following, blind following of the leadership, needs to be abandoned. Mistakes of any leadership of the groups post-1700. So from the movement of Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab, from the 1740s, Gregorian calendar yep, yep, yep. until today and the various groups that branch off from that and the reactionary groups acknowledging the mistakes of the leadership and not having a blind conformity to those ulama by going back and this is me calling for the unity how by going back to a salafu salihun pious predecessors how you have the creed of Imam Abu Ja'far al-Tahawi rahimahullah as a framework of unity, which was actually a culmination of all the disputes that occurred from the time of Sayyiduna Abdullah bin Umar, the Sahabi, from his time when the man came, it's in the Sahih of Imam Muslim, and he said, such and such conveys salam to you. And he says, do not give, give him my salam because I have heard he has become a Qadari, a person who rejects Qadr. So from that time, until the time of Imam Abu Ja'far al-Tahawi, you've had disunity amongst Muslims. And Imam Abu Ja'far al-Tahawi, he compiles this aqidah, Bayanu Sunnati wal Jama'ah, which is a unifying creed. The aqidah of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah is contained within the aqidah Tahawiyah. Sure. So Aqid let's say... Aqidah Tahawiyah is taught by some Salafi inclined to art and teachers that they will have its own uh, commentary. I've seen this myself. Aqidah Tahawi is taught. Yes. So get, getting onto that point, this Aqidah Tahawiyah, for instance, in Aqidah Tahawiyah, he says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not contained by the six directions. Very clearly. He says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not have appendages, adawat, instruments. He, he does not need limbs. He is not in need of limbs. He has no limbs. So when you check a Sheikh Muhammad Nasiruddin al Albani's edition of the Tahawiyah, he writes in the commentary that I doubt this is from even Al Imam Abu Ja'far al Tahawi, just making that claim because it contradicts his belief. So this is all the annotation of all the later people. So someone who says he's a Salafi, he follows Nasiruddin al Albani before he actually follows a Salafu Salihun. That is the issue of ta'asub. And this is found in every group. Yeah. So Not say, just Salafis. They say the same about staunch Hanafis. Staunch Diobandis, staunch Brelvis who stick to a position of the school uh, religiously. Let's examine. Uh, okay, with the Hanafis, you have faroor, issues of faroor. So these issues of fiqh you've asked. These issues of faroor were disputed amongst the Sahaba Ali Muridwan and those disputes were then recorded and preserved by the four schools because initially there were more than four schools. Initially there were over 12 schools, fiqh schools. Then they all uh, died away with time like the Zahiriya and others, mm -hmm. the school of Sufyan Thawri. Mm -hmm. And why do we limit to the four? Because the four, the usul is, has been preserved. The origins, the maraji have been preserved. These disputes of Faroo are from a salafu salihun. The Salaf disputed these things. So these are permissible disputes. So if you say the Hanafis stick to their legal rulings, those are legal rulings from the time of a Salaf Salihun, which are valid differences. Like the difference between Al-Imam Abu Hanif and, uh, and Al-Imam Abdul Rahman Al-Awza'i, for instance. These are valid disputes. But the you're, you're talking about creedal differences? No, Faroor. Uh, which is no, no, I'm about the other, no, these are valid disputes, okay, but, but, but as far about. as creedal uh, disputes are concerned, whichever group you bring, 
it must go back to the way of the ijma' of the Salaf, the Salaf Salihun, and I go back to the creed of Imam Abu Ja'far al-Tahawi. So the Hanafis will just go back to the creed of Imam Abu Ja'far al-Tahawi, who was a Hanafi himself. He was the nephew of Imam al-Muzani, who was a great Shafi'i Imam, the student of uh, the nephew and student uh, of Imam. Uh, so uh, so Imam Abu Ja'far al-Tahawi was the nephew of al-Muzani. Yeah. Al-Muzani was the student of Imam Muhammad bin Idris al-Shafi'i. And then Al-Imam Shafi is a student of whom? Al-Imam Malik. And he's teacher to whom? Al-Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal. And he's a student of Al-Imam Muhammad al-Shaybani. See how they were all interlinked. But they disputed furu'. They disputed uh, subsidiary rulings, but they agreed on the creed, which is contained within the Tahawiyah. That is the... So if we... Are you saying there's no normative basis in the Islamic tradition from the first three generations of Islam where, where Allah has described himself or has stated uh, things like hands, throne and stuff like this that you're telling me that there's never traditionally, normatively, historically a position amongst the Muslims that what Allah says is as he says. So again, if you refer back to Tahawiyah, mm-hmm. Yadullah is accepted as Sifa of Allah as an attribute of Allah. That is the Ashari position. Despite all the propaganda you hear from the Salafi du'at today regarding the Sha'ira that they only limit the attributes to seven, seven. or 20 attributes, mm-hmm. this is false. They accept these as... So you believe 99? More than 99. The kama- We say the kamalat of Allah is endless. So the sifat are endless. Okay. So the yadullah is sifa. We affirm... The Yadullah is Sifa, which is Sifatul Ma'na, which means a qualitative attribute of Allah. Where does the dispute start? Imagine I'm discussing with the Salafi. He says to me, you Ash'aris are Jahmiya. We say, why? Because Jahmiya is in reference to Jahm bin Safwan, mm-hmm. who totally denied all the attributes, all of, the Allah. attributes of Allah. He yes. even said, you cannot refer to Allah as Shaykh. I say to him, why are we Jahmiya? He says, you are limiting the attributes of Allah to seven. I say, no, we affirm all the attributes. So in his preconception, he has preconceived ideas of what an ashari is. They make straw men and then they burn the straw men. Would you, he, say, that, would you say the other side straw mans them when they say you guys are mujassima and anthropomorphous? Again, uh, I would not say something like that to a real athari, a person who follows actually the athari school. There's a distinction. But... If, why, do, why do people make, I mean, by people I mean Mashaikh and Du'at from the Ashari tradition and the Maturidi tradition, why, why do you make that distinction between a classical Athari and a, someone who's an Ibn Taymiyyan? Beca- why because, do do, why, why is that? as I mentioned, if I say to him, yeah. he will say, you deny Yadullah. We say no, we accept and affirm Yadullah, it's in the Quran, whatever is in the Quran and Sunnah, we affirm. He will say, in response to that, then how do you affirm it? We will say in response to that sifa. It's an attribute. Sifatul ma'na, a qualitative attribute of Allah. If we stop there, there is no dispute. But they probe the issue. What do you mean by sifatul ma'na? Do you mean haqiqatan? As Then we counter the question by saying, what do you mean by haqiqatan? Do you mean a limb? If you mean a limb, Allah has negated the limbs. So now you're talking about in, whether is it literal or metaphorical? Is that no, the, again, uh, literal in the sense that it's an attribute of Allah is fine. Yeah. Literal in the sense that it's a sifa of Allah. But when you probe it more, this is not the way of the salaf. So imagine you met Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal. Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, rahimallah, if he meets a Muslim and the Muslim says to him, Ayadullah is sifa, he would leave it there. He would not probe it even more. But the later groups... But why? How do you say that? Why did you say that? You, you, you said that conclusively. Is yes, there, I say it, that conclusively because the way of the Salaf was not to probe the Sifat. Once someone acknowledges the Sifa, they left it there. And even uh, saying Sifat, this was a later... The term Sifat was only innovated later. Because of the interaction Muslims had with Christians. And Otherwise, Greek, the Sahaba never even utilized the word Sifa. It was the Tabi'een. 
the successors, they use the word sifat. The later groups would probe these issues to the point that they would go into detail that you have uh, the likes of Uthman, uh, Uthman bin Sa'id al-Darmi, uh, the author of al radda al jahmiyyah makes excessive statements, excessive statements, which later then influenced other ulama like Abu al-Abbas Ahmad bin Taymiyyah, great humbly jurist, but nevertheless was influenced by, by that train of thought, which today, uh, today's pseudo-Salafi movement, it's, it's on what? Steroids. So it's that on steroids, probing it to the point that Salih al would say things like, uh, we don't, uh, we, we do not negate jism for Allah, neither do we affirm it, because Allah hasn't negated jism. These, these type of statements are found in modern Salafi works. Okay, are you saying that that type of narrative or explanation that we neither deny or affirm what Allah has denied to affirm for himself? Are you saying that has no normative traditional basis in the first three generations? That has no basis because Billy Jma' by consensus, we negate jism for Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not a jism. So who gave the right to the Ashaira and the Matwizis to then... Uh, and the Atharis. And the, no, no, I want to just I'm, just... I'm playing advocate here. Who gave them the right to then start taking metaphorical approaches to what they would argue is very explicit in meaning and language. So this uh, concept of ta'wil, yeah. what you refer yes. to, concept of ta'wil. The Asharis do not negate the attributes tr through ta'wil. How? For instance, the word istawa. So it's a verb. Istawa is one of the divine actions of Allah. We affirm it. But then someone will say, how do you affirm this? What meaning do you affirm for istawa? The Asharis, they look at the linguistical meanings. They, they come out with eight. Let's say uh, the premise is that there are eight meanings. They negate what is impossible for Allah. Whatever is impossible for Allah, what the Quran negates, they negate. The remaining meanings, they affirm. They say the general meaning we affirm, but we cannot specify, the sp we cannot be specific regarding the meaning in terms of, let's say, Istawa means six different things. We cannot specify the meaning because Allah has not specified the meaning. This is referred to as tafweed by the Asharis. This is what they mean by tafweed. That is different to the tafweed of the Salafis, the modern Salafis. Then the Asharis, some Ashari Imam may come along. He interacts with some people. They say, what is the meaning? He says, it's possibly this meaning. This is referred to as ta'wil. But he does not say it with certainty. That that wheel is not negation, negating the attribute. That that wheel is actually affirming the attribute. This is the type of that wheel that Al Imam Al Nawawi, Yahya bin Sharaf Al Nawawi, does in his commentary on Sahih Muslim, and the type of that wheel that Ibn Hajar al Asqalani does in Fathul Bari. This is not negating the attribute. He, they're saying it's possibly this meaning. Now, Ibn Qudam al-Maqdisi, the Hanbali of student of yeah. Sheikh Abdul Qadir al-Jilani, he, when he condemns ta'wil, what is he condemning? He's condemning any Asha'ira who come along and they say, it is this meaning with absolute certainty. Why is he condemning that? Because the meaning has been left, meaning this, it's unspecified. So why are they specifying with absolute certainty? So no one can come along and say, it's this meaning with certainty, and at the same time, no one can negate the total meaning. That is known as al-ma'na al-kulli. So they affirm all the attributes, and some of them may sometimes do that wheel and say it's possibly this meaning. This is the actual position of the Asharis. For the Muslim laity, what is the problem if you were to ask an average Muslim, and you see it in a lot of da'wah videos when people are going to remote African villages and stuff, and you know, you speak to people, where is God? Like even Muslims, and, and they'll do this. Is, is there anything in the text, in, a, in, in the Quran, the Sunnah, about the, the, the kind of the inclination to look towards the heavens and the skies when, you, when, you're, when you're making dua or when you're speaking of Allah? Because this is something that some would argue is humanly instinctive for some. So uh, there's a famous uh, Turkish Maturidi scholar, Sajikli Zada. He has a book, Risala to Tanzih. Mm -hmm. 
where he states, and this book's published by Darul Fath. This is the classical Ashari Maturidi position. Lay people are left alone on this issue. If you go to a layman and you say, do, uh, uh, do dua and he looks up, you don't prohibit him from doing that. Because if he has an inclination to do dua, because the dua is raised to the heavens and he looks up, you do not prohibit him from doing that. How common is this? It's so common. You Very see? common because the prayer is, uh, the Quran states, <laughs> To him, ascend the pure words and the good actions, he raises them. So they, the actions rise to the heavens. So people looking up to the to the heavens or to the to the Kaaba, when they look to the Kaaba, uh, and they refer to it as Baytullah, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean Allah is residing in in the house. We know what they mean. So this is the fitra that you refer to. Is but that is that different to say that Allah is, is on His arsh with angels holding the arsh up? What's, how, how, why does that become a problem then? So again, if someone cites a hadith or a verse of the Qur'an, and they left it to that, without annotating, without adding excessive commentary, mm -hmm. that is permissible. The Ash'aris do not condemn that. So someone is reading the hadith that God, Allah, descends to the lowest heaven on the last third of the night. Yeah. You narrate the hadith. What enters the minds of the people is not tashbih. So Ibn Kathir, in his tafsir, he mentions that when these verses of the Qur'an or these type of hadith are recited, only the, mush uh, the mushabbiha, those who liken Allah to creation, only they will think of resembling Allah to his creation. But the Ahl Sunnah, they just recite the hadith and leave it. Bishay, can I ask you something? Yes. How, how implausible is it that when you hear the hadith of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, lowering to the lowest, um, the lower heavens on the, on the third is it the third night of Ramadan or the third of Ramadan? The, the third last, of uh, the last third of every night. Every night, yeah. How can you not think of it directionally? So, again, if I say to you, Allah is arriving with His punishment. Allah is arriving with His punishment. Tashbih doesn't come to my mind that Allah is arriving physically like a body. This is true. Yes, but the one Similarly, about going to the heavens. Allah is descends to the lowest heaven. This is why when you check the hadith. And Al Imam Nawawi adds the commentary to the meaning. Mm -hmm. This is why the Ashari sometimes would resort to specifying a meaning. Okay. This is the reason. Now, this, the later Salafi movement, they say this is negation of the attribute. We say it's not a negation of the attribute because we affirm the general meaning of the attribute. It's ijtihad of the ulama sometimes to specify a meaning within those meanings. It's not a negation of the attribute. We merely, merely microscopically touch the surface on some issues that have been discussed for nearly over a millennia. Can there be Muslim unity without conformity in creed? You see, if you have a sultan uh, like Salahuddin al Ayyubi, rahimullah. You said this to Ustad Abdul Rahman Hassan, do you remember? <laughs> yes, of course. And this time I've got with me <laughs> what is that? the aqidah of. Salahuddin al Ayyubi rahimullah, which he commissioned to write, okay. to have been written, and he enforced this on the army. Okay, can you tell us just some snippets of what's included in it? It's no different to the Tahawiyah, it's some additional things. Why is the five pillars and the six articles of Iman not enough? Why is that not sufficient? That is sufficient for the layperson. Allah, the angels, Revelation, the prophets, all good and bad comes from Allah on the Day of Judgment. Why is that not enough? Because later groups bring about discord. So for instance, finality of prophethood was not sufficient for Mirza Ghulam. So he violated an article of faith by claiming prophethood. So when people violate an article of faith, then other ulama, they elaborate on this. Achha, okay. And that leads to division. That leads to schism. And it's a natural process. So for instance, a Shia, they deny caliphate of Sayyiduna Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anh, it's going to lead to schism. So uh, expecting unity uh, in that sense, it will never happen as long as you have uh, the Juhayman al utaybis of the world. Because Juhayman himself was what a Salafi background 
person of Salafi background. He studied with the likes of uh, Muqbil, mm. Sheikh Muqbil yeah. al-Wadi'i. Obviously. He studied with uh, Nasruddin al-Bani and others, yet he formed his own isolated group, which historically we know as the Khawarij mindset. So you have two extremes. One is the Khawarij mindset, and then you have the philosophical mindset. Those who resort to philosophy over the Quran and Sunnah, which, what? by the way, uh, Ash'aris like myself do not give priority to philosophy over Quran and Sunnah. Quran and Sunnah first, and we we give very little relevance to philosophy at all. Why did you choose to single out specifically uh, Sheikh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab and the early Najdi movement when I asked you about creedal unity and conformity? When there were groups that predate that, there are groups that predate MIAW, there are groups that predate Ibn Taymiyyah even. Those groups have uh, finished with the passage of time. Today, the the Salafi movement... Who identifies Atharis and mainly Hanbalites. If someone is a Hanbali Athari, we consider them as Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Not as a... But many Salafis would say that. If they are, it's fine. But if they adopt positions which contravene the ijma, contravene ijma, then it would be a violation of the ijma, and they, in that sense, they need to be refuted. Anything that contravenes an ijma point will be refuted. How do we define ijma? Whatever the four schools agree upon. So, if there's if there's consensus of the four schools, or the imams of the four schools on creedal points, or even a fiqh issue, uh, and someone violates that, then they they violate the unity of the Ummah. The book that you just showed me, the Aqeedah of uh, Salahuddin al-Ayyubi, rahimahullah, can that be applied today? Yes, it can. So, so if I call all the various groups in the UK and I say, let's all unite on this creed. Okay, so let me name some of the groups. The Barelvis, the Diobandis, the Salafis, the Ikhwanis, the Jamatis, Hizb tahrir uh, our brother Some of them are was, not sect. I'm, I'm just saying. I'm, you said, I'm talking about. I'm talking about all the different players, right? From all the different Sufi tariqs, from all the different Deoband ulums, Darul ulums, from all the different Islamist revivalist groups, uh, from our brothers from Al Murabitun in Norfolk to everywhere else. You're saying everyone can unite under that book. So the Sufi groups you mentioned, yeah. Al Murabitun, the Brelwis, all of these would unite under this. The Sufis. I myself being a Sufi, yeah. with no shyness, yeah. I am a Sufi. Uh, the Barelvis and Turuk, various Sufi Turuk, they would unite under the creed of Salahuddin al Ayyubi. You've left a fair amount of people out then. Yes. Now, for the rest, uh, it's for their spokesmen to come out and say, yes, we would unite <laughs> upon this creed. Meaning, what that entails. Did, you, did, you did, unite did, on did, this creed. Did, did the context matter though? The context of the fact that was this written after the liberation of Al-Aqsa or not? No, before. Okay. Surely that's an important context. Yes, of course. And we live in that context today where the Hamas are by default Ashari Sufis, Ikhwanis. Right. So they're a good mix. There's a mix of them, yeah. Yes, there's a good mix in the Palestinians. But you also those who incline a bit towards the Salafi way as well. Of course you do. Uh, but they unite on what? and jihad in the way of Allah. Yes. Yes. So if there is an Amir and uh, the Salafis unite with that Amir and the Amir brings them on a creed like the creed of Salahuddin al Ayyubi, as long as they cause no schism, sch uh, schismatic divides, as long as they do not cause any schismatic di divides, then of course there will be a victory in Al-Quds Sharif. Because that's the higher objective and higher priority to liberate it? Remember when... Uh, Firstly, creedal preservation is a higher objective. Preserving the creed of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah is a higher objective, no doubt. But when people ask what are the most important issues of the Muslim Ummah uh, that we face today, the first one I mention always is the occupation of Al Quds Sharif, removing the hostile uh, IDF from Al-Quds Sharif is the topmost priority of the Muslim Ummah today. There is no doubt in that. Anyone who doubts that, anyone who has a rabe on that, irrelevant to what group they come from, I will doubt them and their integrity. If they say to me, you should not give 
Al-Quds al-Sharif that much importance or the emancipation of Al-Quds al-Sharif doesn't fall into priority. I will doubt their veracity. This is the position of uh, the likes of Al-Allama Khadim Hussein, mm -hmm. Rahimahullah. Rahimahullah. So in, in terms of uh, Muslim unity, uh, with regard to the Diobandis and the Brelvis, the classical uh, Brelvis, this book was written by Abdul Sattar Khan Niazi. These are like the forerunners to uh, Khadim Hussein. Mm -hmm. He wrote a book, Ittihad Bain al Muslim, uh, Ittihad Bain al Muslimin. He wrote this in 1984. To un the Brelvis and the Diobandis are both Hanafis. Both Hanafis. They both theologically identify as um, Ashari. Maturidi. Maturidi, sorry. Maturidi. Yes. So, <coughs> without, that, without going into their dispute. So, so, is, so, is that not enough? Well, this book addresses that. The point being mm. that this issue has been addressed. The, this Abdul Star Khan was a high ranking Brailvi Alim. He wasn't someone irrelevant or marginalized. And this book should be read now by all the Darul Uloom. Graduate. Was that, was, that given so to, you, was that given to his contemporaries at the time? Yes, of course. How was it received? You see, uh, the books out of print. So, in the current times, I've only heard very few ulama actually mention the book. But why? Why I'm mentioning this book is that this book should be read by all the Darul Uloom graduates that we have. So, within the UK and South Africa, America, Canada, New Zealand, you have many Diobandi Madaris. And you have Brelvi Madaris, and you have graduates. They all read Urdu. So they, they give importance to Urdu more than even Arabic. They should all read this book because it addresses the, the issue that you bring up, which is Ittihad Bain al Muslim, how to achieve this, how to go about it practically. Unity. Unity without violating your principles. That's very important because uh, each group is apprehensive of uniting because they believe. By uniting, we violate the principles of our beliefs. But how do you achieve that? That book gives the guidelines. But going back to a broader uh, aspect of unity, I say this creed of Salahuddin al Ayyubi and the Aqidah Tahawiyya is sufficient to unite everyone. Uh, and, and they abandon they abandon anomalous positions, positions which are wrong. It doesn't entail doing takfir of individuals. It entails just saying this position is wrong. Mm -hmm. Like, for instance, someone brought up Recently, they claimed, it's found in a Brelvi book, they claimed, where it says, Chishti Rasulullah, Na'udhu Billah, which is Kufar, Sarih. This person claimed this was in a Brelvi book. In fact, it's not in a Brelvi book, it's in an earlier Sufi book. So what happens in the Indo-subcontinent, if you have earlier Sufi movements, automatically they are labeled as being Brelvi. This person who brought this objection, he came to me, I pulled out volume 15 of Al-Imam Ahmed Khan's Fatawa. He has a book, Hajbul Awar, where he condemns these statements as kufr. So I said, you label that statement as kufr, but here, Ahmed Khan is claiming this is kufr. So no group should shy away if there are mistakes found in their books or previous books, to say at least, not to declare the author a kafir, to at least say, we do not follow these statements. These statements are wrong. These statements are kufr, and we do not blindly defend the statements. So many of the ulama from various groups will have statements in their books, all the groups, that some of them will then blindly defend those statements. And this is what leads to more Division. And you're saying irrespective of your theological position, we should be consistent enough to say that we don't... Blindly follow any one individual. You okay. do not follow one alim. Mm. You follow the ijma. So you cannot just follow one scholar from the Middle East or one scholar from the Indo subcontinent, Indian subcontinent. You follow all the ulama, all the ulama across the board where the consensus is found. So from the, the turn of the century in the 1800s, you had numerous ulama. From Morocco, you had Imam Muhammad bin Ja'far al-Kattani and the Kattanis as just one example. In Egypt, you had uh, the likes of Sheikh al-Islam Mustafa Sabri, Imam Zahid al-Kawthari, 
numerous ulama in Egypt, Sheikh Yusuf al Dijawi, so many various ulama. In Asham, you had the likes of Imam Badruddin al Hassani, who alone is a jama'ah. And then in, in the Hijaz, you had the likes of Sayyid Alawi and numerous other ulama who, are, who uh, prior to him, Ahmed bin Zaini Dahlan. And then in the Indian subcontinent, you had numerous ulama as well, like Abdul Hayy al Laknawi, Rahimullah. So you look at this vast, broad range of scholars. If you limit yourself to one or two, then you will blindly defend their mistakes also. And this is what happens with the modern movements. Why do you think, uh, staying on the topic of unity, but just like I've, I've always wanted to kind of ask you this, um, because you've spoken about it, uh, but I want to ask you on camera. What do you think makes the Salafi Dao so effective in the, in the English language? And when I'm using the term Salafi here, I'm talking about the art speakers, preachers, mashaykh, people who fall broadly within that umbrella. I'm talking from your Zaki Naik to your Mufti Meng to your Muhammad Hijabs to, to is the, Muhammad Hijab even a Salafi? I'm, I'm, yeah, he may not. But I'm talking broadly. I don't speaking. consider Muhammad Hijab as a Wahhabi Salafi. No, no, he would regard himself as an Athari though, and, and, and a traditional Hanbalite. But outside, many would still regard that he comes from that persuasion. He comes from that kind of broader umbrella. Background. Background, yeah. Okay, fine. Background, umbrella, however you want to call it. Not necessarily a card holding Medina graduate Salafi per se. But I would he wouldn't be someone I would even consider a Wahhabi. Okay, but let's put that aside. I'm talking about I'm just I'm just throwing names at you in terms of the English language. Zakir Naik, Mufti Menk, Yasir Qadi, Omar Suleiman. Um, uh, they Muhammad all have Hijab. Salafi backgrounds. The, the tradition is there. The background is pretty much there. I mean, that that's where it is. So why why has that been so effective in the English language in the last forty years? Primarily, because of the English language. Primarily, so all the du'at have been speaking in English, while people from other backgrounds, especially the Indo, Indo subcontinent, they have been preaching in their masajid only in the Urdu language. Is that changing? To a degree, not largely. Do you think it should change? Of course, I believe every masjid should have English speaking Imams. Secondly, they give cultural importance, meaning uh, the non-Salafis, importance to their culture, sometimes over the deen of Allah. And this is counterproductive. It's not progressive at all. With the Salafi movement, uh, they do not commit themselves to one culture, even though they have, uh, they give some priority to Saudi culture. A very peninsula-based culture. Isn't it? Which is fine because Rasulullah so, sallallahu alayhi wa is from Arabia. So you cannot be against Arabian, even though Najdi culture is different to Hijazi culture. So it's my, some of my mashayikh were from the Hijaz. So there's nothing wrong with the Hijazi culture. Primarily, I believe, due to the English language. Not as, there's a third aspect as well. The Salafis attempt to simplify everything to a quotation of a verse or a hadith. While our entrenched, entrenched, uh, some use the word tradition, entrenched background is based on usul from the times of the likes of Imam Muhammad bin Idris al-Shafi'i who wrote Ar-Risala, which is Usul al-Fiqh. So we get technical. But isn't that, in terms of an, an effective form of da'wah, as an effective strategy to bring newcomers to the faith, for example, a remote village in the Amazon or in Africa or a massive conference packed with thousands of Hindus, which Zakir Naik used to do regularly, why get overly technical when one verse or one hadith can be enough to convince the people to become Of Muslim? course, there's no doubt on that. And But you must also examine the success of the Sufis in history. Historically. They would argue that was due to state intervention. Not really. For instance, in Malawi... Nizamul Mulk, he non, pretty much solidified and consolidated state... Not in in, in uh, non-Muslim countries. So oh, okay. in Malawi, for instance, you go to Malawi... From 900 years, the students of Sheikh Abdul Qadir Al Jilani radiallahu an entered Malawi, made thousands and thousands of Africans into Muslims, Qadris. They do the raqs as well. I did the raqs with them. I saw that. Yes, the, they are Qadri. They sing the Qasida 
شيئا لله يا عبد القادر which the Salafis would deem as shirk and kufr which I will address with you also but thousands of them became Muslim similarly where we come from the That's Indo Bangladesh. subcontinent yep. Shibul Qarat al Hindia from Bangladesh your country of origin or region of origin I prefer the word region I like it as well region yeah? of origin. from the region of your origin up to our region of origin in yeah. Kashmir all that region you know and I know that they accepted Islam not on the hands of Babur when he entered as an invader as a no. conqueror they accepted on the hands of Sufis yeah. so those Sufis were effective the Sufis today some of them are effective Sheikh, Sheikh Shah Jalal Al Yemeni rahimahullah who brought Islam to Sile exactly. was of a Sufi tariq Indonesia but also for Malaysia. jihad yes Indonesia mm. Malaysia all these regions hundreds of millions of people entered the fold through, at the hands of the Sufis even today I'm even about, today I'm about for the last 30 40 years English language up to recent history you've had Abdul Alim as Siddiqui who was successful in the West Indies in Africa you check his uh, biography he was a student of Ahmed Rida Khan he spread Islam in multiple places but today in in the UK in the past 40 years some will claim that some Sufi groups have been successful like a Sheikh Abdul Qadir as Sufi of the Murabitun yes. uh, many people accepted Islam at his hands there was uh, a Sheikh Nadim al Haqqani thousands of people accepted Islam at his hands and there are other Sufi sheikhs as well uh, maybe not as vociferous or vocal as the Salafi movement but people who are listening to me and you will claim that there are just as successful Sufi du'at also Allah knows best okay now look with regard to shirk I wanted to address something with regard to shirk and this is all these Salafi youth every year they have a crop of new Salafi youth who are quick to denounce Sunnis Asharis as Mushrikeen Quburiyin This is something I wanted to address. What is the definition of shirk and what is the defin- uh, definition of tawhid according to the Asharis? They say at ta'addud fi dhat, numerosity in the essence, numerosity in the sifat, numerosity in the af'al of Allah. So if you ascribe that of Allah to makhluq, it's do, shirk. Do you remember the istighatha debate? Yes, of I course. Ch- How can I, I forget? So can I give you some scenarios? Now, before going into yeah, the scenario, I'll, yeah, I'll lay out the, the principles. Yeah. This is essential for people to understand. Sure. If I ascribe the that of Allah to someone in makhluq, it's shirk. Mm. If I ascribe the sifat of Allah to someone in, makh- in the makhluq, it's shirk, no doubt. If I ascribe the fa'al, the actions of Allah to someone in makhluq, it's shirk. That's the definition of shirk. It differs to the Salafi definition because, you know, they have the taqseem. Mm-hmm. They say... Uh, they have uh, Rububiyya and uh, they say everyone acknowledges Rububiyya, yep. which the Ashari say no. Not everyone acknowledges Rububiyya. But what the Ashari say, as long as we are not ascribing the sifat of Allah or the af'al of Allah, the attributes of Allah, or the actions of Allah, or the that of Allah to anyone, it's not shirk. Do the Asharis accept the hakimiyah of Allah? See, this taqseem of hakimiyah, this... Uh, label of hakimiyah because that, that was the intra difference between the salafis well we in the asharis it's a very simple position because when they they refute the likes of a sayyid qutub they say that anyone who denies anyone who denies and does iltizam meaning he takes it as, as a position of denying that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone is the one who legislates the Sharia, mm. then they fall into kufr. They need to say that explicitly. But now someone says, Ya Abd al-Qadir al-Jilani. Straight away, the Salafi will say, you are a mushrik kafir. Why? Because you called upon a person. That, that man will say, no, I don't mean to ascribe the that of Allah to Abd al-Qadir al-Jilani, neither the sifat of Allah, neither the af'al of Allah. So the Ashari say, he's not a mushrik. Al-a'malu bin niyat. His actions are by his intention. What is his intention in saying, Ya Abdul Qadir al-Jilani? Then they enter the discussion of, is saying this even permissible? 
That's a fiqh debate. It's not a debate of aqidah. It's actually a fiqh debate. So the Shafi'is, they debate this, the Shafi scholars. Zainuddin al-Iraqi, for instance, says it's haram. Yes, not uh, specifically Abdul Qadir, just calling upon someone who's passed away. But is that the Mu'tamad position of the Shafi school? The answer is no. Because you have Shaykh al-Islam, Zakaria al-Ansari, and all his students who, who were all influenced by Ibn Arabi, by the way. They were all influenced by Ibn Arabi. And how many of them? Many of them, great Shafi'i scholars, all of them say this is permissible, this is not uh, shirk, it's not haram, because the ruh of the wali from the grave has a different type of interaction with the person. This is deemed as a shirk al-akbar today by the Salafi movement and not as an issue of fiqh. And this is one of the major points of division. This is the actual major point to the, uh, to the, to the extent that the destruction of the graves, declaring people as mushriks like ISIS did, killing them, all of this is based on just this one difference. So when you talk about unity, uh, this one actually has more effect on the ground politically than the Sifat issue. Because they can tolerate someone to a degree, they can tolerate an Ashari on the Sifat issue. But when they see a layman exaggerating at a grave, or even a scholar singing Qasida Khamariya, which is, it calls upon Abdul Qadir al-Jilani, mm -hmm. commonly sang amongst thousands and millions of Sufis, they declare them as being polytheists like Hindus. So how do we reconcile that issue? That is the question. So how do you reconcile that issue? Well, how you reconcile that? Because, that, because, because those brothers who make those labels and accusations are part of this ummah. They, yes, are of course. they are Muslims. They are Muslims. They identify as Sunnis. They believe in the Quran and the Sunnah and Sahih Sitta and all the texts that we follow. Yes, of and, course. And, and that every Sunni claims to follow. So how do we incorporate them or that mindset into one that is less divisive where it can lead to excommunication? There are two practical steps. Number one, actually discussing and dialoguing the de definition of Tawheed. Like this definition I've given, the definition I mentioned earlier, does that contradict their definition? The answer is yes. But debating those contradictions, for instance, they say the Mushrikeen of Mecca, they knew the Rabubi of Allah. This is the claim of Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab. The only difference was that they worshipped other gods alongside with Allah. So they say calling upon anyone mutlaqan, unrestrictedly is shirk. فَلَا تَدْعُ مَعَ اللَّهِ إِلَهًا آخر. Do not call upon with Allah another God. The Asharis will say, yes, calling upon a God with Allah is shirk because you give him the sifat of Allah or the you ascribe the actions of Allah or you, the that of Allah to that person. But they will say calling mutlaqan unrestrictedly doesn't fall into shirk. It def depends on the niyyah of the intention. So then the Asharis will say this is an issue of fiqh. Now when it becomes an issue of fiqh, then what needs to be addressed, what needs to be addressed is the excessiveness at the graves. So the Wahhabis, they have their excessiveness, which is what you see a shrine and you see that there are people doing excessive actions, rituals and bid'ah at the shrines. When they're performing bid'ah at the shrines, the excessive action is to declare them all kuffar, killing them in some cases. And then what? bulldozing the shrine, which may even be an authentic grave of a Sahabi, like Ammar bin Yasir an, in Raqqa. The, the grave is authentic. As far as I know, it's authentic. Uh, what did they do? Place dynamites and blow the entire place up. That is an extreme. That was ISIS. That was ISIS, but nevertheless, ISIS has this aqidah. They have this belief. And, like and, Taliban and Maturidi. Yeah, and the, early, and the early Najdi movement did this as well. Yes. There's so no then the, the other excessiveness on the part of our public, not ulama, maybe some ulama may, out of jahl, some of them may have gross positions. 
which, as I said, we should be consistent and refute those positions also if someone has a wrong position. But the excessive nas at the graves, like tawaf, uh, not validated by any fatwa, not validated by any ashari fatwa, uh, sajda at the graves, not validated by any Hanafi jurist, uh, excessiveness, various forms of excessiveness, there needs to be action on the part of the Hanafi jurists, Shafi'i jurists, Maliki jurists, which I believe, for instance, in Syria and Bilad al-Sham, I lived in Damascus for many years, there was no excessiveness at the graves. So I would pray my salah at the, the Masjid of Ibn Arabi. His, his grave is located outside of the Masjid, not in the Masjid. There was no excessiveness at the grave. Never did I see anyone... No wailing, no crying. None of that. No putting money there. None of that. No direct direct prayers or asking for things. No. No one, by the way, many people think that we call upon awliya as dua. Dua is only to Allah. No, people believe, no, people believe that dua is being made to the person in the grave. This would be totally impermissible. Okay. And, the, that, and that whatever they're asking for would be granted independently. In some of our no, this would be totally impermissible. There are mazahirul ghulu. What do I mean by mazahirul ghulu? Excessiveness. I've seen this from some shiyukh. They go to the grave of a wali, and they may, and as if they are making dua, they should not be doing this. This should be prohibited. It's not permissible in the Sharia of Allah to do dua to a person, as if you are doing dua and the, the people behind are saying Amin. This is totally impermissible. Dua is only to Allah. You only do dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the, what I refer to as madhahirul ghulub, the excessiveness at the graves, the rituals, these type of things are at two polar extremes. So you have a spectrum of extremes. The middle way is the way of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. You preserve the grave as a historical grave. So if you look at the grave of Badiyu Zaman, Nursi, mm. Said Nursi, Mm-hmm. In uh, Turkey, it's constructed according to the Sunnah. I also sent you remember which I sent you a picture of which uh, or, an Ottoman grave did I recently, and it's quite there was no real demarcation of it. Well, the early Ottoman graves and cemeteries. The preservation of the graves, how the preservation was done in the time of Salaf Salihun, was you could place a boulder, a huge boulder. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam placed a boulder on the grave of Uthman bin Madhoun the foster brother of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's in the Sunan of Abu Dawood. And the boulder was placed, the boulder was so huge that the Sahaba young boys, they would have competitions in jumping over the boulder. So that is permitted, uh, placing boulders over the graves to preserve them, uh, to uh, place a marking on the grave. All of this is an issue of fiqh. It's not an issue of aqidah. But remember, there was an ijma of the, of the tabi'een that in the time of, uh, and Sahaba also, that Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an and Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu an, both of them were buried in the chamber of Sayyidatu Aisha radiallahu anha with four walls and a ceiling. Mm-hmm. So if, for instance, in, in Damascus, they have the grave of Muawiyah radiallahu an. The grave of Muawiyah radiallahu an has four walls and a ceiling. Would we demolish this? The answer is no. Why? That preserves the grave. Why does it preserve the grave? If you see the Khabith Rawafid, who, by the way, I have no desire to unite with, just in case you well, there's no, like, entertain ideas no, with them. No, no, no. I've okay. Always, I've, so, I've always maintained the position. Because of their foul tongues. Mm. Some of them, they go to the grave of Muawiyah radiallahu an, and they curse him. And if it were up to them, they would demolish the grave and exhume the body. So the Ahl Sunnah, they have what? They have placed walls around the grave. They have placed a dome on top of the grave. This is also permissible. But the Salafi movement, they would not permit this. Even though Abu Bakr Siddiq and Umar al Farooq radiallahu anhumah were buried in a room. They were buried in a room. They say that's specific to them. At one point in 2007, I debated Salafi ulama in Al-Madinah and, he, and the, the alim, 
He said, that is specific to them. I said, with what dalil? What dalil do you have that that's specific to them? If you have historical individuals like Al-Hasan, radiallahu an, Fatima, radiallahu anha, Uthman, radiallahu an, the Khalifa, these great people, Al-Imam Malik, rahimallah, in Al-Baqi, why is it offensive to have four walls and a ceiling? You will bar the Shia from approaching those graves. You will bar them because they do excessiveness. They take the soil. Um, you, there are videos of them doing these type of yeah, practices. Yeah. You will stop people from doing excessiveness because there's they cannot the, even approach the there's grave. There's also people who take soil back from Medina and do madness as well from the Sufi um, tradition. As yes, well. but the fiqh books condemn this. So it's makru in the Hanafi school. It's makru to ev even Al Imam Ahmad Rida Khan, who the Salafis deem as the greatest mushrik. He mentions taking things out of Al Madina is impermissible. You cannot take the rocks out. Tabarruk is a different issue. Tabarruk. But taking the soil out of Al Madina is not permissible because it's haram. So you cannot take the soil of the haram out of the haram. That would not be permissible. We've spoken about unity on a macro level in terms of how it affects us in the UK and the English speaking world. We've spoken about uh, certain obstacles and possibilities and visions of what a unity may look like uh, with creedal differences. Let's bring the podcast to a close by discussing what, how that would look if it were to manifest politically, if it were to transcend borders and states. Uh, before we do that, I just wanted to give to you Sounds this like book. It. What is the book? So if you remember when we had our historical debate with the Al-Ustad Abdul Rahman Hassan. Of course, in 2015. 16. 16, yes. 2016, 16, the yes. summer, the hot summer of hot 2016. Summer. It was, yes. Classical debate. Seven years ago. Uh, there was a book that I had, Shawahid al-Haq, uh -huh. of Al-Imam Yusuf al-Nabahani, who oh, is the grandfather of... Sheikh Taqi al Uthmani. Uh, Taqi no, no, Nabahani. Al Nabahani. The founder of Hizbut Tahrir. The founder of Hizbut Tahrir. That was his maternal grandfather. Yes, and he actually, uh, Taqi al Nabahani, lived with him. With uh, Imam Yusuf Nabahani in the last years of his life. Sheikh Yusuf funded his studies in Al Azhar and, and as well. So the Hizb basically should take uh, <laughs> creed from uh, Imam Yusuf al Nabahani. <laughs> Have you given it to our dear friend and brother Abdul Wahid? Inshallah soon, <laughs> inshallah soon. He, he, creedly is a Sunni. So irrelevant to association with Hizb tahrir whatever people make of that, Hizb tahrir do, do, do you make a distinction with revivalist groups? Yes, I do. So like the so Ikhwan, Ikhwan in Syria, many of them are Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, meaning Asharis. Yeah. You have the likes of a Sheikh Usama al-Rifai, mm. Saria al-Rifai, uh, these are scholars who are pro-revolution and they were, uh, they all Ashari Sunni scholars, meaning uh, uh, Sheikh Muhammad Ali Sabuni, rahimullah, was not uh, Ikhwani. He was not Ikhwani. He was not associated with any group. But nevertheless, quickly, uh, this book, uh, you asked for the copy that I, I had. This has been commissioned by Darul. Uh, our publishing house is called Al-Imam Yusuf Nabahani. Inshallah. And we've commissioned this, so this is for you. Two-volume book, I, inshallah, in the future when uh, I meet Al-Ustaz Abdul Rahman, he'll be getting one of these as a gift <laughs> also. So a few of the brothers uh, <laughs> need to read upon our act. And this covers the jihad issue as well, jihad, okay. direction for Allah. And he takes a soft opinion on Ibn Taymiyyah. So there you go. <laughs> Thank you for this gift, Sheikh. <laughs> Let's talk about the Khilafah. Let's talk about the caliphate. But before we even start this conversation, we can't really talk about that as an ideal, as a concept, without first accepting the existing situation of the ummah, which is we are 1.8 billion people. We are 50 countries, nation states. We are 50 nation states. The vast majority of the rulers and the regimes are in one of the pockets of the five superpowers of the world, and that is America, Russia, China, Britain, and France to a lesser extent. 
if they are not in the pockets of those five countries, then they're in the pockets of IMF, World Bank, um, who are ultimately funded and, 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 and sustained by mainly America. That's the existing quo, uh, the st existing status quo. The existing status quo is that the borders and the flags in which we take such great pride in are barely 100 years old. Uh, we have to also accept that whilst in many of these constitutions there'll be an explicit mentioning of Islam or the Quran being the state religion or the ruler has to be a Muslim. The like in Syria. Like in Syria, like in Bangladesh as well. Bangladesh has the Quran mentioned in the constitution, but it says it is a secular country. Pakistan's constitution was pretty much the British constitution and, until certain tweaks were made um, later on. I Under Bhutto. Under Bhutto, yeah. So what I'm saying to you is that can we even speak about the caliphate without first addressing the existing situation of the Muslim world? Uh, of course not. We need to address the current situation. So moving on from creedal unity to now and decreasing sectarian disunity in the sense, because some people... Uh, take two extremes. Some people think that when I say decreasing sectarian unit, uh, disunity entails that we acknowledge uh, the false beliefs of other groups. When I'm mentioning it because of the Quran, the Quran states, The command is from the Quran, So the, dis the disunity comes from the people who cause the disunity. But then the disunity needs to be addressed. Moving on from that, we go on to political disunity in the sense that a young man born in Pakistan is raised thinking that the Pakistani flag represents Islam. Pa using Pakistan as a prototype example. It's a good example. It's a very good example. It's a good example. Then similarly, thinking that the Pakistani army was created to free Palestine or to free Kashmir. And the Pakistani army has a religious, uh, the motive of, of the deen of Allah. So you have the likes of Mir Zahid and others promoting the Pakistani army as the army of Khurasan, even though Pakistan geographically doesn't fall into Khurasan. Afghanistan and Iran fall into does, Khurasan. Yeah. Now this person is, is raised with saluting the flag, almost like a takbir. Every morning, nationalism is a disease that has entered the hearts of so many Muslims that they cannot think out of the, the paradigm of nationalism. To the extent when I wrote my book, Navigating the End of Time, in the introduction, I mention uh, Kashmir. Yep. A Pakistani nationalist in one of the comments on Amazon, he mentions that I am disappointed that Sheikh Asrar refers to Kashmir separately to Pakistan. So he's reading, I am mentioning Kashmir as a, as a district, geographical district. So you could go to any part of the world as a Muslim, um, of the Muslim world, and we as Muslims would see them as equals. So I write in Damascus, I write them in Damascus, not as a nationalist. But this person is framing that as a nationalist that why has he not recognized Kashmir as Pakistan? That's an issue for him. But for me, it, an issue would be, why is Pakistan, instead of being a nationalistic uh, state, uh, a state that calls for patriotism to the state, as opposed to loyalty to Allah, which is the difference between Khilafa and a nation state. A nation state calls for loyalty to itself as an entity, while the Khilafah calls for what? Loyalty to Allah. The bay'ah is to the Khalifa because the bay'ah is to Allah. And even the Khalifa is not above the law. So this distinction alone should bring into our minds that nation states are disuniting the Muslim Ummah. So we need to remove the illness of nation states where people are uh, prioritizing a flag or an anthem or a constitution. None of these things uh, have a place in the deen of Islam. The Khilafah is the only form of governance recognized uh, in the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Sheikh, so as part of removing, or at least forget about removing, even to have that discourse in the Muslim majority world uh, can get you into trouble. People have been killed, imprisoned for life, tortured, violated, simply for calling for the Khilafah, for simply merely having the discussion of how would the future of the Muslim world look today if such a polity existed which transcended borders, which transcended cultures and language, like it did for centuries before. We're not saying a utopian state. We're saying a state or a polity which reflects the religious ideals and values and morals of the people of that region. How can you have that conversation without at some point criticizing the existing status quo? Which by extension would mean criticizing the rulers and the regimes of the Muslim majority world who cement and consolidate and actually safeguard the interests of the global superpowers with their corporate and kufri agenda. So you mentioned uh, people being arrested and jailed in the Muslim majority countries. That is true, but there are exceptions. For instance, there is a book, At-Ta'arruf ala that written by no less than Al-Imam Muhammad Saeed Ramadan Al-Bouti at ta'aruf ala that Controversial for some people a Sheikh Al-Bouti Controversial for some people He wrote a book on caliphate Living under the regime of Hafiz al-Assad They would argue within a safe space No If you read the book He refers to even the Nizam The Nizam Al-Hakim even in many of his videos, he mentions that if the overall structure of the Nizam, the governance, is based on kufr, then the leader is a kafir. He states this, which is antithetical to Michael Aflaq's Ba'ath Party. Ba'athiyah, founded yeah. by Michael Aflaq, oh, yeah. 1947. It goes against the very ethos of the Ba'ath Party, the ruling elite. So all the some of the ulama... They were exiled, like a Sheikh Abdul Rahman Hassan Habannaka. He was exiled. He's the son of a Sheikh Hassan Habannaka, who is the teacher of a Sheikh Ramadan al Bouti. And he was exiled to Makkah al Mukarrama. But he wrote on all these topics. But then you have many other ulama, the likes of uh, Al Muntasir Billah al Katani. He wrote on the caliphate while living in Morocco. There's writing about the caliphate theoretically, conceptually, academically. And this proactively, actually, I'm not saying, by the way, I'm not saying that these great scholars and alims who you've mentioned didn't do this. The very fact that they wrote books and authored books and provided this knowledge to be accessible is a contribution to it. That To, to, to deny that would be to deny reality. But surely there is a difference between the subject as an academic subject and, and, the, practical... and the practical call for it. So the engagement of it on a grassroots. Al Muntasir Billah attempted this in in uh, Morocco. His his political party was then banned. I think in the 1950s. Then he moved and migrated to Al Madina. He went back to uh, Morocco also. Some of them proactively attempted to implement uh, the Khilafah in the uh, nation states, but uh, again, one alim is not sufficient. You need a body of ulama, a body of not only ulama. A body which is known as Ahlul Halli Wal Aqt. If there is no such body as Ahlul Halli Wal Aqt, you will never see a Khilaf. What is Ahlul Halli Wal Aqt? I define that in my forthcoming book, Intellectual Intifada, which you have in your hands, you have a manuscript. So the book, uh, inshallah, will go to print. It's gone to print. Inshallah. It will be arriving within a few weeks. In this book, Intellectual Intifada, I give the practical guidelines. Mm -hmm. And one of the key points that I mention is Ahlul Halli Wal Aqt. What does that mean? It means firstly, these are people of ilm. They are people of ilm. They have ijtihad knowledge to the level of ijtihad regarding governance. Secondly, they have taqwa. Taqwa is a prerequisite. We cannot have khilafah without people of taqwa. They, they need to be people who pray Qiyamul Layl, Tahajjud, like the Sahaba. They, uh, people who are incorruptible. And thirdly, they have the ground influence to bind the people. 
until we do not formulate a group of people of Ahlul Halli wal Aqd, the formulation of a Khilafah will remain an impossibility. What is the position of Ahl Sunnah according to your reading, research, teaching from your teachers with regards to criticizing Muslim rulers? Not that I'm not saying rebelling, because then when we go into rebelling, we'll have to talk about, because I know the Sharia has specifications of different types of rebellion. Am I correct? Yes. So like uh, utterances, armed struggle, even to the extent of where is it where is it happening in 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 the khilaf or in the state is it happening in a predominantly non-muslim area in a muslim and so forth but i'm asking you criticizing muslim rulers publicly i've never heard from our ulama or from the classical works and even the contemporary works where they state criticizing a ruler is prohibited this is a strange and alien concept to me because when i read on the sahaba Ali Muridwan, our deen is firstly from the companions Ali Muridwan who took it directly from Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. We know that they would openly criticize even the caliphs, the al Khulafa al Rashidun, when they needed to complain. So this concept of do not criticize rulers, do not criticize the leader, is a, an alien concept to Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. It's not something I would deem as being a normative Islam. I've only ever heard it from people aligned with certain regimes or governments, but even our ulama who are aligned with governments and regimes. Like in Egypt, you have Ash'ari ulama in Egypt. They do not say, do not criticize the ruler. I've not heard that. Maybe some of them have, but as a majority, they do not say this. They do in Chechnya. Well, Chechnya is not really a place of uh, centre of learning. It's not, but it is... It's not it, a cent- like Al-Azhar. Tika, for, okay, granted. Yes. So Al-Azhar, Al-Azhar al-Sharif. The ulama of Al-Azhar, they never say, do not criticise a ruler or a policy. If they do, they mean do not endanger yourselves. If ulama say this, they mean do not endanger yourselves, your property, your family in any way. This is fine. What about the argumentation that by criticizing Muslim rulers publicly, whether that be in the form of leaflets or social media, you are instigating the people, which could potentially lead to uh, discord, division and instability in the land. If it leads to bloodshed, then people should desist from it. Okay. Bloodshed as we observed in Syria, because revolution against rulers is based on principles. Like when Al-Imam al-Nawi states that by ijma, you cannot take up arms against the ruler. It's in context of what, as long as he has no kufr and sarih and bawah, but let's say he does dhulm to the point that he, he needs to be restrained from dhulm. That's conditional also. Conditional to what, like Ibn Abidin states, that the Ahlul Halli wal that group, they implement the toppling of the government, not the common man. What does Ahlul Halli wal This happened in the Ottoman era, very common. Yes. The Ahlul Halli wal Aqd and the Grand and the. They, they intervene. They intervene, yeah. So when you do not have that type of intervention, you will have the bloodshed that we observed in Syria. So mm. ulama are sitting abroad, they are sitting abroad encouraging on the internet and television channels the common man to rise against the government while they are sitting abroad. Then those same Syrians are now in refugee camps while people who encouraged their revolution are living in luxury. So you have young children with no shoes, walking in snow, the young children being washed ashore onto the beaches, young women being prostituted, being pimped. All of that, who is responsible for that? is people who give a fatwa that leads to that type of facade, that type of corruption. One would argue, but that's surely the price you pay for jihad. That's the price you pay for war. That's the price yes. you pay for change. So that's those the price ulama you... sitting in Turkey, those ulama sitting in various countries across the globe, they should send their elder sons. Why didn't they send their elder sons to go and join the people in Idlib and the people in Halab? They, had the, the, they encouraged the lay people but their own children are in safety. You check some of their backgrounds, you will find that they their own families are in safety, but they, they didn't encourage their own children to go and take part in revolutions. Similarly, 
they criticized ulama who called uh, for restraint, but those ulama stayed in Syria and some of them were killed. They remain in, in Bilad al-Sham and they were killed in Bilad al-Sham. I want to ask you a question about Sheikh Ramadan al-Buti. Uh, may Allah have mercy on him. Um, people believe that he was an outright supporter of the Assad regime, that he justified their oppression, their crimes, he praised their, the, the, the regime, he, he praised the way they ran the country. Um, those are the accusations uh, that are levied against the Sheikh. Uh, how much of that is true? So, a Sheikh Muhammad Saeed, his first association with Al -Haf uh, Hafiz al Asad was in the late 1970s because Hafiz, he conducted a book fair in Damascus. They have the Syrian book fair every year. He requested from his intelligence who was the best-selling Muslim author. They brought the book of Sheikh Muhammad Saeed, Ramadan al buti which was Naqdu Awham al-Madat al-Jadaliya, which is a critique of dialectic materialism. Now, he was a socialist, Arab socialist, but he did not like atheism. So he needed an Arab sheikh, a Muslim sheikh. Sheikh al buti was uh, ethnically, he was Kurd. He needed a, a sheikh to counter atheists in the country. So he invited a sheikh al buti to his palace. A sheikh al buti took the advice of his father, Mullah Ramadan, well respected. Mullah Ramadan said, when you go, do not request anything from Hafiz. Do not request anything from him. And only answer the questions he asks you. This is uh, on record, meaning uh, a Sheikh Al Buti says this on record. When he goes, he answers his questions on atheism. Later, a debate, uh, a, a national television debate was organized by Hafiz, where a Sheikh Al Buti debated a high ranking socialist atheist on national television. That debate's online. That atheist became a Muslim. So Al Buti then addressed. The Alawi, Kufar, he addressed that to Al Hafiz. On record, this statement of Al Buti. On record, where? Al Buti stating this. It's on video. He says, Al Hafiz said to him, Our people, meaning the Alawi, Nusairis, we call them Nusairis, not Alawi, so people don't get mixed up with real Alawis. Mm. Nusairis, he said, We are Jahil people, ignorant. So you need to teach them. So he took a position, Al Buti, that the young, the youth, the Nusayri youth need to be taught Islam. So what did Al Hafiz do? Every year he would send five hundred youth from La Dikia to, yeah. to learn Aqidah with Al Buti in Damascus University. So this was a cause of conflict between Al Buti and Ikhwan al Muslimin. Al Buti said, "I want to preach Islam to them." The Ikhwan, because of the grievances of uh, from 1979 to 83 in Hama, they disagreed. Ah, the grievances predate that as well. Sure. No, uh, the the slaughter happened. Oh, in the, the, the yes, slaughter. The yes, slaughter. Yes, yes. yes. The gri the grievances started once uh, even prior to half the last yes. meaning the political yep. grievances. But Al Buti was ultimately a preacher of Islam, so he saw that preaching Islam to the Nusayri minority is more important than involving himself politically. By the way, this is me just giving you his perspective, not necessarily defending every aspect. Secondly, he claimed, Al Al Imam al Buti claimed that Hafiz accepted and adopted Islam outwardly in front of him. And even if you notice Al Hafiz and his son Bashar, they only ever worship as Sunni Muslims. They don't attend uh, worship with Shia. Or That's a political move though, Shah. Of on. course. I'm not uh, defending. Mm. I'm not defending them. Tick. Yes. Now, the Shiuch who had dispute with Al-Buti, they said, Sheikh Al-Buti is naive. 
exactly what you are saying. This he's, is been fooled, he's been fooled by the regime. This is what narrative they have. They're going to use him to justify the regime and to, to enable us. And to, I'm fine with that. Yeah. But when I asked some of these shiuch in Syria at the time, in the early 2000s, when I asked them, and I said to them that, is he not a kafir? They said to me, these are shiuch, notable shiuch. They said, al Buti is a witness to his shahada and his Islam. Who's? Hafiz al-Assad. Hafiz al-Assad and Bashar. Which is fine. You cannot judge Bashar's Islam, meaning outwardly, if he professes Islam, that's between him and Allah. But anyone who is a Nusayri, by belief, is a kafir, no doubt, like a Qadiani. There's no doubt. But then what happened, going fast-forwarding, to two th many things happened, but fast-forwarding to 2010, uh, Al-Bulti was accused of saying there's, there is no difference between the Syrian army and the Sahaba. There's a clip online. Yes. You go and look at the series his son, Dr. Tawfiq, released after. It's a series called Fatabayyanu. It's a short series. It's called Fatabayyanu. Six small clips giving you the true context. He doesn't say this. He says there is no to receive the rank of Mujahideen of jihad, like the Sahaba. There is nothing to attain that reward between the army and attaining that rank except Tawbah to Allah. And then he condemns the barracks. He says the barracks are filled with sins. The barracks are filled with this. Meaning it contextualizes some of those clips. So you're saying it wasn't a, a likening to the no. Sahaba. You're saying that it was meant that uh, the martyrdom that you're seeking can be attained. With Tawbah. With Tawbah, you, be just to the guy. Be just to al Buti. In the sense, all these clips at least look at the context. Like for instance, here in Birmingham, there was a, a Syrian who came to the UK and he, while discussing with me, he said, I have respect for Sheikh al Buti, but why did he refer to the protesters as scum? I said to him, he didn't say this. He said, yes, I, he did. I saw the clip. I said, if you look at the clarification, which al Buti gave one week after, he said that there was a group of people who stood at the back of Al-Umayyad Masjid who didn't join the worshippers and they were not praying Salah. And I referred to them as Huthala, not the worshippers. The man didn't believe me. So we went on the internet and I showed him the clip where Al-Imam al Buti clarifies. The man, he shed tears. He said all that time in Syria, I had bad thought of this man just because of this one claim. Or for instance, they say he said Basil al-Assad is in paradise and he condemned a Sheikh al-Abani. You check the original clip uh, which Sheikh Tawfiq placed online. The original clip, he doesn't say it in that context. And he doesn't claim that uh, a Sheikh al-Bani is condemned to hell or one none. None of that is true. So you say none of those statements are true or attributed to... Well, what happened, he went to a ta'zi of Basil, Basil mm. and he said some words with regard to Basil, but not the words that were claimed regarding him. So at least have justice in terms of what you claim regarding him. So for instance, I went to al Madina al Munawwara. And I met an old Syrian man who, who has been living in al Madina from the 1980s. And when I mentioned al-Sheikh al-Buti, he said to me, al-Sheikh al-Buti received money and land from the Assad regime. Anyone who lived in Damascus, now in Britain alone, there are dozens, if not hundreds of students who studied in Damascus. And even the foes of al-Sheikh al-Buti will be witnesses to this. The man did not hoard wealth. He lived in a flat. They all know where he lived. He lived in Ruknuddin area, a, a common area. The man would catch public transport. They know this. He would jump on the bus with everyone else. You could catch him walking up the road. If anyone wanted to assassinate him, that's how they assassinated him. They could assassinate him. They know this. His opposition know this. The Shiyu who oppose him, they accept this. Even a Sheikh Ali Sabuni, Rahimullah, great scholar. Who does his son believe were the killers? He believes that 
Wahhabi terrorists killed him. Not the regime. Not the regime. He's uh, convinced of that. But nevertheless, any particular group? I'm uh, unfamiliar of the details. Okay. But a Sheikh Muhammad Ali Sabuni, rahimahullah, he referred to a Sheikh Al Buti as a munafiq because of his position. But a Sheikh Sabuni, rahimahullah, associated with the Sheikh Al Buti. There are videos online where they do speeches together and a Sheikh Sabuni praises the book of a Sheikh Al-Buti. He praises one of his books on uh, Islamic civilization in the Quran. He praises the book. He knew that a Sheikh Al-Buti led the funeral prayer of al Hafiz Al-Assad. He knew this, but he only condemned him later. Now when Al-Buti is asked, why did you lead the prayer of al Hafiz Al-Assad and cry? What does he say himself? This video is online also. He said to the interviewer, am I a rock? The interviewer said, what do you mean? He said, I am looking at the president dead in front of me, knowing that this man ruled this country. And now he's a dead man going back to Allah. I'm crying because of that. He answers that. Why did he lead his funeral prayer? Because Hafiz gave the, the will that al Buti should lead the prayer. Because according to al Buti. Hafiz accepted Islam, according to Al-Buti. And Hafiz even gave that testament that this man should lead my prayer. Now that's all between them and Allah. That's all between them and Allah. But the main thing is at least do justice to the man when you claim that he was completely supportive of the regime's zulm. When you know there are videos online and fatwa and he's in nasimusham.com where he condemns the army for shooting at the protesters. That's still up online. Mm. His fatwa condemning the soldiers who shoot the protesters. And a video. He said, I condemn the zulm on both sides. The zulm on both sides. He says this very clearly. So, or for instance, when people place... Is that a fair comparison though? To compare the might of the Syrian Arab no. army? No. To defenseless, to, to begin with it's defenseless. Not fair, it's not a fair comparison. But he was, in that case, he was not referring to defenseless civilians, he was referring to the armed groups that had entered Syria at the time. That is what he was referring to. He prayed Janaza, al Buti prayed Janaza over the protesters. Those videos are online as well. So when the protesters, their bodies were brought, he's praying Janaza over them. He's, he prays Janaza over the Syrian soldiers also. Because he said, do not fight for a blind flag. He said, who is your leadership? They never answered him. A group of people went to visit al Buti, and they said to him, uh, join the revolution. He said, name your leader. They were unable to. Later, the, uh, the FSA made well, look, George Sabra a Christian. George Sabra their leader. Well, look, so if the FSA was having a Christian as their leader, how were, can they condemn al Buti? There were major defections from the Syrian Arab army. To begin with, they formed the Free Syrian Army. Then when they realized that the Free Syrian Army, I'm talking about the, the other side narrative, is that when they realized the Free Syrian Army, their objective wasn't one that was necessarily in line Islamically, as in what in an Islamic state, wanting to rule by Sharia and th those kind of things, but it was more of a secular democracy, the more kind Supported of... Supported by NATO and yes, West, the Western yes, Zionist bloc. Yes, yes. Well, if not supported, uh, weapons being made available from their allies, regional allies, be it Turkey, Qatar, Saudi and so forth. So it morphed into something different very quickly. Exactly. So revolutions fall into the hands of the, the, the powers that be, meaning the game players. But al Buti, to summarize al Buti, I'll simply say the man was avoiding bloodshed in his country. That is the fair judgment. He was attempting to avoid bloodshed in his country. Even his enemies, like this man called Habash, Sheikh Al-Habash, he's a, a pro-revolution, but he has odd views on other things. He says on live TV uh, and others, other ulama, they have said the man would refer to the Nusayris as being kafir. He had Islamic views, those are clear in his books. Why would he write for the caliphate? But the man was avoiding bloodshed in his country. And for the revolution not to fall into the hands of Zionists, which it did eventually. Zionists and Western powers in general. Because I have a question, a serious question for all those guys who are pro-revolution in Syria. Thousands of Salafi youth, radicalized Salafi youth, 
entered the sham bilad sham killing people from various backgrounds some of them weren't really salafi they just wanted to go and help the muslims of syria thousands of armed individuals okay forget about those that came from where, Libya, tunisia not this, the... this is the question where is that response when it comes to palestine where are you guys in helping the palestinians thousands of muslim youth if they entered the state the illegal state of israel that would be a security problem for israel today but tens of thousands entered syria because they destroyed the country because the jordanians would not let them in the egyptians would not let them okay, in okay when they occupied the borders of syria and when they were occupying syria in 67 and 73 no when when these salafi youth and various groups were occupying parts of Syria including the border oh, yes, of Israel yes, yes. Okay. they did not even launch single grenades into Israel Jabhat al-Nusra had some exchanges with the Israelis I don't doubt the sincerity of some of the Syrian uh, people I'm referring to these foreign I, elements I, I, I'm I not being conspiratorial no. I'm saying ideologically no no there's, there's no this, there's no secret about it yeah. Libyans Tunisians and people with a far more hardline understanding entered the Syrian scene and messed things up and that's how ISIS was and born and have never lobbed grenades and rocket launchers right, yes. into uh, onto IDF yes, yes. soldiers this is my issue but certain Syrian factions have fought certain Syrian Syrians s- certain Syrian but Salafi you have to remember it fight. doesn't matter whether the Syrians are Salafi or not remember Salafism in Syria Syrian Salafis like a Sheikh Abdul Qadir al arnaut two months before passing away he he would have gathering with a sheikh abdul rahman al shaghuri one of the greatest sufi leaders of syria L- uh, many of these non syrian salafis would not know that the funeral of a sheikh abdul qadir al arnaut was led by well i don't know who led it but was attended by sufi asharis in maidan so s- when you say salafi syrians they they are a totally different breed to anywhere else Sheikh Abdul Qadir Al Arnaut was a Salafi, but the, the funeral was attended by all Sufi Asharis. They say Sheikh Abdul Qadir Al Arnaut abandoned Salafism towards the end because of the Sufi shiukh. Nevertheless, those Syrians, people from Bilad Sham, are all anti-Israel. Syrians, whether they are Sunni Muslims, people from Sham are gen- period. They are anti-Israel. So Georgia, I'm, I'm Jordanian, re- Lebanese. I'm referring Syrian to these person. foreign elements. Okay. All these. young radicalized people not ever doing anything on that illegal monster that we have known as Israel mm-hmm. nothing at all i have issues with that of course and security services played their part in that there's no denying the mukhabarat of respective countries the turks the qataris the saudis they all played their part in allowing certain elements const- to and undermine const- kurds the kurdish nationalists and to undermine the revolution and at, at the orders of their masters at course. the same time the nationalist kurds are pro israel yes the pkk and yes pro israel yep. elements then you have uh, turkey's policies through nato yep. with israel and trade links with israel allowing these type of elements to enter syria to destabilize syria do you see all of this as obstacles to the establishment of the khilafa of course okay so now bringing the podcast to a close before you finish intellectual intifada has the solution no no we're there we, yes. we're wrapping up on this so with this soon to be book intellectual intifada blueprint for restoring the caliphate we've spoken about the fact that without an ahl al-halli wal aqd there will be no khilafa no one of the defining attributes of this group of people the influentials who combine the people and hold the leadership to account have to be people of taqwa yes We've also discussed that the things with which we spoke about whether they be the global superpowers the many Muslim countries that are in their pockets or fulfill their geopolitical agenda and interest in the region with all of that I know that a passionate subject of yours could you of course offer a book on it is the end of times yes when Imam Mahdi alayhi salam comes will there be a khilafa already established or will he establish the khilafa so what we need to make clear is that the fard on the ummah is to reestablish the khilafa in the sense that even books like 
شرح العقائد of Taftazani. They mentioned that the Muslims should appoint an imam who distributes the zakat. These are some of his tasks. Protects the borders, <laughs> implements <laughs> hudud for justice. Yes. All these things. That is our fard. That is our fard. So the purpose of the intifada book... Kifaya? Fard kifaya, yes. Okay. So someone has to be doing this in the ummah. Yes, who are the ahlul halli wal aqd. So for... For us to fulfill our fard, this book is written how this fard should be fulfilled. Now, it's speculation in terms of ashratu sa'a for anyone to take the position, like some people take this position. We should be inactive until Al Imam al Mahdi. We should take a passive role until Al Imam al Mahdi. This has never been a Sunni position. This is, in fact, it's a new thing, isn't it? It's, it may be inspired by a Shia way of looking at things. Okay. Some Sufi groups hold this, not all, some Sufi minorities. Uh, I would say common people amongst them. But the shiuch that I met in Syria, they had a proactive role. They had proactive roles in uh, Bilad sham and elsewhere. That our fard we need to fulfill. Whether that is fulfilled or not, that is entirely up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Al-Imam Al-Mahdi shall appear in his time, those prophecies will occur as they have been prophesized. But in our time that we live in now, prior to the main red flag occurring, what is the main red flag? When the Euphrates River diminishes, reveals a mountain of gold and there is a war, that is a major red flag. It can occur at any time. You, po you post about that quite a lot. Yes. Why? Because the river is undergoing major changes because of policies. Turkey's construction of the dams, Ataturk Dam, uh, it causes water levels to recede. Uh, the policies since Saddam Hussein, the removal of Saddam, the policies of the Iraqi government have not helped uh, the water levels. And the water levels, they diminish at various intervals, revealing ancient treasure, treasures, ancient civilizations. That entails that the sign is close, that we should always be prepared. But irrelevant to the signs of the end of times, our fard is there also. Which is to appoint an imam over the believers. Which is to, again, the blueprint for the Khilafah is explaining what is the fard. And this book is uh, unique in comparison to other books because it has a panoramic view of the entire subject. Okay, so... To wrap up, what can Islamic revivalist groups take from this new upcoming book? Groups that have worked or as part of their methodology, one of the main objectives is to re-establish the Khilafah or uh, Iqamuddin to establish Allah's deen on earth and to bring more Sharia into their states. What can Islamic revivalist groups and activists take from this? I would uh, request all the Ikhwan, Ikhwan al Muslimin, uh, all the Hizb al Tahrir, the Jamaat -e Islamis, and uh, of course it goes without saying TLP, Tahrik al Labbaik, who uh, what, al Alama Rasul uh, Alama Khadim Hussein. What about, what about brothers uh, from the jihadi uh, persuasion as well? All those groups will benefit from this. You may not agree with some aspects but you need to read the book and you need to engage with the book because the group addresses something so important which is we've had too much bloodshed it addresses that so like the iraq iran war over a million people died for what for Baathist socialism and an iranian regime right, utilizing sure. the love of the ahlul bayt in the rural shia exploiting that love and sending young boys to the border of, as suicide bombers. Yep. Millions of people died for nothing. Similarly, the suicide bombings that we have carnage, to what end? What has it achieved? It addresses all of that also, in the sense that we can have bloodless revolutions. We can have bloodless change. We can have change without shedding blood. Who said a revolution is always a bloody revolution? And that's where it's an intellectual intifada. It changes 
the strategy. It changes the mindset. It changes the approach. It's a lateral thinking approach. It's a lateral thinking book. It approaches the entire issue differently. It's different to your Hizb tahrir approach, different to your Ikhwan approach, different to your jamaat islami approach, different to democratic elections approach, all of that. So inshallah, I, I pray to Allah, it's accepted I mean. by Allah. And it has a major impact in all the Islamic groups across the board, I mean, across the uh, the spectrum, that they all read it and benefit from it. And uh, of course, uh, people like a Sheikh Abdullah Azam, Rahimullah, I mean. they would have loved this book. Yeah. <laughs> Do you regard this Sheikh Abdullah Azam as a Salafi? No. As far as I know, he was a Shafi'i in fiqh mm. when he went to Afghanistan. He didn't even do Rafal Yadain because the people were Hanafis. Mm -hmm. And as far as I know, some of our shiuk held him in high esteem. In fact, he, uh, books regarding him were sold in Damascus in the city center. So Salafis, they sometimes like hijacking uh, certain personalities. Yes, so Khattab, for instance, he was a Salafi, but he was so mellowed down as a Salafi that some Salafis deem him as a Kharji and others, they hijack his personality. But Khattab doesn't represent what some of the Salafis represent today. Similarly, uh, there are historical personalities that they sometimes attempt to hijack, like Ahmad Didat. Ahmad Didat's father and Ahmad Didat, they would do mawlid. They would attend uh, Sufi Sahib's grave shrine in, in Durban city. The man was a Sufi. He would be called a Qaburi. But yet they hijack the personality of Ahmad Didat. That sounds like maybe a conversation we could have in another four and a half years. No, nah, not, not so long. But it was a pleasure having you. By on. then you'll have an intellectual intifada. So. Inshallah, we won't need to have this conversation. Inshallah. Yes, inshallah. It was an honor having you back on. Um, I pray to Allah Azza wa Jal that he accepts all your contributions. I mean, there's a means of benefit uh, for the Muslims and non-Muslims alike. I mean, and uh, inshallah, we won't take too long to have you back on again. Inshallah ta'ala. Jazakallah khairan. Brothers and sisters and friends, I hope you all enjoyed today's episode as much as I did. Please do remember that you can find this show on all the major audio platforms. And of course, on YouTube, do remember to click subscribe to the Five Pillars YouTube channel. And until next time, Assalamu Alaikum Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuh.